so let's go ahead and get started. Um, all right, so we're going to continue from where we were on Thursday. Uh, we're still talking about current sources, and today we're going to start by talking about continuing to talk about high swing current sources. Uh, then we'll talk about current source matching considerations. And then we'll start uh, op amps, uh, beginning sort of with a review of op amps, things that you should already know. Uh, I guess your homework four is due today, and your homework five is online. I'm no longer going to pass them out in class. Uh, so this is a popular class today, it looks like. But maybe a lot of people are working on their homework or something like that. So, yeah. Intensive on calculations? Well, it shouldn't be too intense on calculations. What? Is that right? How are you? It depends on how you're doing the problem, I suppose. So, so what you should do is sim get a symbolic answer first, and just then just plug in your numbers. Are you doing it that way? Even after you're done with your symbolic answer, there's too many numbers to plug in? Well, I think with these problems, it's always going to be the case because you're dealing with devices that have a lot of parameters in that sort. Um, I think it's important for you to play with numbers, too, rather than just symbolic. Right? So we could do this where all your homeworks are all symbolic. You're just you know, putting symbols down. But if you do that, you'll never know the order of magnitude. And in circuits, and basically anything engineering, you need to know the order of magnitude. Because then you can't make decisions correctly that way. So I know there's a lot of classes, right, that they may do that. They may, even on exams or so, have all symbolic and no numbers and stuff. I don't do that. So there will be numbers even on the exams, but mainly because you're kind of, you're kind of worthless as an engineer if you don't know the numbers, right? You could be a good physicist and know all the symbols and the variables. That's great, but in my opinion, you'd be useless out in the work world or research and that sort of thing. So most research, you know, most discoveries in research are made with back of the envelope calculations. They don't just put a symbolic equation there. They actually plug in some numbers and they sort of guesstimate, you know, how big something is, et cetera. Then they get a back of the envelope number as to what to expect and then they move in that research direction. So for me, numbers are important, but I don't think these homeworks are that number intensive. Maybe it's just different from your, that's part of the game here. You, you got to get that familiarity with the numbers. So. Um, okay, so I guess I'll just continue from where we were last time. So last time we were doing this high swing current source. So hopefully you all remember what this was all about. This was all about trying to make sure that at the output, which is the actual current source that's being used in an amplifier or whatever it's biasing up, you want to make sure that you're able to lower the voltage at this node here, which is the output node, as low as possible. Because you want to be able to do that so you have the maximum output swing, which maximizes your dynamic range. And to do that, you know, you got to make sure that all of these devices stay in saturation. None of them ever goes into the linear region, because if they go into the linear region, you lose a lot of your gain. Uh, in particular, you use the impedance of these devices, and that then causes a loss of gain in the amplifier that's using this device as a load. Um, and so what you want to be able to do is drop two overdrive voltages, well, one overdrive voltage across each of these transistors, which means two total overdrive voltages across from the drain of M2 to ground. Okay? And this circuit helps you to do that because it, one, generates your V bias voltages at these gate nodes here, the gate nodes of M3 and M4. And it does that by just diode connecting these devices, sending a current through these devices that automatically biases them up to support this current. Okay? And then we try to use exactly the same types of devices at the output as these devices if we can. But in this case, we're not doing that because what we're trying to do is use this device, M5, as a level shift. Okay, so at this node here, we generate two VT, uh, well, at the end result, when we choose this device to be a quarter the size of the rest of these devices, if it's a quarter the size of the rest of these devices, then it has to use more voltage uh, in order to support this current. 
And that's something we want because we want VT plus VOV across this device and then a VT plus two VOV across that device giving us a VT, well, I've got all of these, two VTs plus three VOVs at this point here. We then level shift by VT plus VOV, which reduces this to one VT. Uh, no, I've got this written out this way because we were talking about uh, um, body effect last time. But this becomes one VT plus two VOV. You get another shift down here, VT plus VOV, and that gives you a VOV right here. And so it's this device that's important to bias up correctly. It has a VOV across it. And so that allows this device to go all the way down to a VOV and a support two VOV here. Okay, that's much different than say this device M6 here. Uh, which if we're doing a regular CAS code in, in this type of configuration here, this would have too much voltage across it. All right? And so the last thing we talked about, and that's what all these symbols are that I've been writing there. I've been very specific about which VTs are adding to which because you'll notice that some of these devices like M2, its body is not tied to its source. And that means its threshold voltage is going to be larger than the threshold voltage of, say, any of these transistors down here where their bodies are tied to their sources. And so where we're relying on all these VTs and VOVs to add and subtract, uh, you end up, after doing this analysis, with a, a, a situation where you'll subtract off these VTs, but the VTs you're subtracting off here are larger than the VTs that add up. And so you end up having a voltage across M1 that's smaller than an overdrive voltage. And if it's smaller than an overdrive voltage, that means M1 is no longer saturated. That means it can no longer give you a very large output impedance. And so we had to do something about that. And what we did about that, well, there's a couple of things you can do about that. So one of the things you can do is, is take M4, M5, and M2. These are the problem transistors because their bodies are not tied to their sources. You could take these devices and just tie their bodies to their sources. That means tie their wells to their sources. Okay? But we don't like to do that because that takes up a lot of space. That means each of these transistors has to have its own well. You can't have sharing of wells between these transistors. And that takes up space. It takes up chip area. And chip area equals money. Right? And so we don't want to make this product, if we're making one more expensive than it needs to be, we'd rather not tie all of these, their, their wells to their sources. And so the other thing we can do is just design a little more conservatively. So we determined last time that making this device M4 one quarter the size of the rest of them, mm -hmm. we were looking for two VOVs dropped across it. And that's what was necessary to put one VOV across M1. Uh, well, if you just make this device a little smaller than one quarter, and you can increase the voltage drop across here instead of two VOVs, maybe three VOVs. And in order to get three VOVs, you know, you could do the same calculation we did last time. That would require a device being one ninth the size of all your other devices. Okay, so it's a much smaller device than the rest of them, uh, but it can support a larger amount of voltage dropped across it, which then guarantees that you have at least a VOV across M1. Okay? And that guarantees M1 stays in saturation. So that, that's a solution to this problem and the solution that's usually used. Okay? Any questions about this that I'm talking about here? I'm really just reviewing what we did at the very end of last lecture. All right, so the last thing that we tackled here was another issue on this, and that's that in this particular configuration, you notice that M3 has a VT plus VOV across it, across its drain to source. Okay, but M1 does not. It only has a VOV across its drain to source, and that means their drain to source voltages differ by, by a VT. Okay, VT can be not, not an insignificant number, 0.7 volts. If you have a 2 volt rail, that's a significant amount of voltage on this. And so, one issue you may not like is that if their VDSs are different, then you'll automatically have a slightly different current I0 from your IREF. 
Okay, so this is your reference current that you're trying to replicate using your current sources. Uh, but in this case, you know, they're not going to be exactly the same. Now, how different are they going to be? It depends on what lambda is. And in most of the older processes, lambda is a very small number. So this doesn't matter too much. But in more modern processes where your channel lengths are much, much smaller, it's hard to keep this lambda that small. And so this may become more of a problem for more modern processes. So we have an issue here, and that's that VDS1 uh, does not equal VDS3. And in order to solve that issue, uh, we probably want to see if we can come up with an alternative biasing technique. So the solution for us here is going to be um, use an alternative biasing scheme. Okay, and so what is that alternative biasing scheme? Well, we have to think about what the problem is here. The problem is, if we go back to this circuit here, now we've got this device tied as a diode-connected transistor, and this device is not. Okay, as a diode-connected transistor, that forces VDS to be equal to VGS, which is too large a voltage, right? It's VT larger than it needs to be to keep that transistor in saturation. And so, what we'd like to do is get rid of this diode connection. Okay, but how do we get rid of that diode connection while still allowing these transistors to self-bias each other? Uh, well, there is one configuration you can think of here. And so let me just title this first. So this is alternative biasing scheme for a cascode current source. But what you can think of doing, right, you're always going to have to have your VDD, of course, and you're going to have a reference current, which usually is generated by some resistor with a voltage across it, but I'm just going to draw it right now as a current source. I'll show the actual rendition with a resistor sometime later in this lecture. Uh, but again, we're trying to bias up a cascode, so we're going to have a stack of these NMOS devices here. This will go to ground. Let's call this M1 and that M2. And there's not much we can do about the gate of M2. The gate of M2 is probably going to have to be biased up with some kind of bias voltage. So I'll call that VB, which is like a V bias. Some V bias generator is going to have to bias that up. Uh, but with M1, what we did before was we tied its gate to its drain. Okay, and that's one way to guarantee that we have a voltage on the gate. That's what we're really looking for. We're looking for some way to put a voltage on the gate of M1 so that it self-biases itself up. So last time we tied it to its drain, but this time, let's be a little more clever and let's go up this way. Okay, so tie it actually all the way up to the drain of M2. So the drain of M2, of course, is a very well-defined voltage uh, because you've got this current running through M2. M2 has some channel resistance, M1 has some channel. It's like current going over two of these resistors there. Right, so this is a very well-defined voltage at the drain of M2. And so if we did this sort of thing, uh, then what do we end up with? And now we still, we still want to be able to provide the right voltage at the source of M2. Okay? And so back here, the right voltage at the source of M2, um, which is a device then eventually that would feed you know, this, this device here, I guess I'm calling them both M2, but M2 here is equivalent to M5, for example, right? So we want the voltage um, out here at M2. Actually, no, it's not equivalent to M5. It's equivalent to this M2, M1 right here. Okay, so we want the voltage across these two here. Right, we want to drop across here a VOV, not block the one. And I want to also drop across M2 a VOV there. Okay, but at the same time, this voltage right here across uh, the gate, the source of M1, what is that? That's VT plus a VOV. Okay, if that's the case, then that means this voltage here is also that same voltage, right? This voltage right here is also VT1 plus VOV, because after all, this and that are the same node. Okay? 
At the same time, I know that if M2 is going to be in saturation, I'm going to drop across it a VT2 plus a VOV. So that voltage there is going to be a VT2 plus a VOV. And so what do I need at the base of M2? Because this is what I really want to bias up now. right? So I want to do this. But in order to do this, the only thing that I've got to satisfy now is applying a voltage at the base of M2. Okay. Yes. Well, M1 is just a, uh, it's a VGS, right? VGS is equal to VT plus a VOV. VOV, VOV. Yeah, so, so you're, you're talking about a problem that I'm about to talk about. Right? So we're not going to be able to do it just like this. Because I'm just introducing the circuit now, but then I'm going to have to put a modification to fix what you're talking about right now. Right? M2 and M1 are the same as the ones over there. Where is the amplifying transistor? It's going to be up here. So, so this, M, see, M2 and M1, these feed M2 and M1. Okay, so the way this actually works is this is going to go out. You know, it actually isn't going to go out. I have to show you the real circuit, right? This is going to go out, and that's going to go out. But right now, let's just talk about this, right? All I'm doing is exploring an attachment between the gate of M1 and the drain of M2. So that's all I'm doing right now. Okay, I haven't shown you the current source yet. It's going to look different from this. Okay, so you, you're right to ask all these questions right now, but let me just get through this here, and then you'll see what the real current source looks like that I'm trying to get to. Okay, but right now, just, you know, just rhetorically here, what do we need at the base VB in order to provide the maximum output swing to VOV? Well, I need something at the base that's going to guarantee that this is equal to a VOV. Okay? And so I need the voltage at the base to be equal to a VT2 plus a 2 times VOV, right? Because if I subtract out VT2 and VOV, then I end up with a VOV. And so I need this to provide what we're looking for, which is maximum <coughs> output swing, uh, where the minimum output voltage is going to be two overdrive voltages. Okay, so that's what I'm going to need to put at the base VB. Okay, and so in order for this to work, right, and I would like this to be able to go down all the way to VOV right here. Okay, but in order for this to work, then then what do I have to see here? Right, in order for this to work, I'm going to need VT1 to be greater than VOV. to keep M2 saturated, right? Because if you look at this, right, the, the way that I've got this, if this is VT1 plus VOV up here, right, then I already have a VOV dropped here. That's exactly what you were saying, right? That means VT1 has to be greater than VOV in order for M2 to remain saturated. Okay, so that's how I can try to satisfy the condition that all, both of these transistors are saturated. And so how do we do this? Okay, well, we know one way to do this. Okay, so we can make M2 large enough so that it can have a very small VOV and guarantee uh, that that's less than VT1, okay? So if we make M2 large enough, right, it's going to have a small VOV. Whatever VT1 is, we can guarantee that v, VOV is less than that. But in most cases, right, that's a little too big, right? And so let's investigate this some more, okay? What we're really trying to do is bias up this, not the base. I've been calling this base. We're biasing up, biasing up the gate, of M2, okay? And so how can we generate that VB? Well, one thing we can do 
is use a resistive bias generator okay, to put the right voltage uh, sort of at the gate of a, a device that's equal to M2. Okay, so let's, let's draw an equivalent sort of way to make this. So like I said, this is not the current source. This is just sort of investigating what's possible, investigating this possibility of tying the gate of M1 to uh, the drain of another transistor instead of its own drain. And so let's investigate right now what we can call a resistive VB generator. Okay, so here's where I'll have VDD. I'll have a current source, which I'll call I1 here. And that is going to feed a resistor now. It's then going to feed this device M6. And now I'm going to put a diode device at the bottom here. as M5. Okay, and this now, now I'm going to take this for M6 and put it around this resistor. So sort of similar to what we just drew on top there, except now I've sort of replaced M2 with a resistor RB. It's a B. Okay, and I put another device M5 below this here. Okay, so this is now what the actual current source is going to look like. And it doesn't look like yet that it solved the problem uh, we're trying to do. But, but this is just the generator here. This is part of the current source. So this, what this does is it generates this voltage VB that then feeds this thing up top. Okay, so I'll draw the thing up top again. So this will have that same current I1 going through it. And again, I will draw how exactly you implement those two I1s here. Uh, but this is now going to go into that stack of devices. that I showed before. So this goes out like that, and that attaches there. This does exactly what I drew up top there. Okay, so let me use this side here. Okay, so you can compare the two of these, right? This right-hand side here is identical to the right-hand side in this picture here. I just want to draw this a little more clearly here for you. Okay, so what I've drawn here is a V bias generator here for device M2. Okay, and I've got to be careful in the end, I need to satisfy this thing where VOV of device M2 is going to be less than VT of 1, but we'll worry about that in a second here. But right now, what we're right, trying to do is just generate this this voltage right here at the gate of device M2. All right, so let's make sure that we've done that here. So if we go through this and we analyze exactly what we've got, we know we've dropped across the gate to source of M5. We know we've dropped across that a VT of 5 plus a VOV. Okay, we know that in M6, because this is also a gate to source voltage, this is going to be a VT of 6 plus a VOV. Okay, that means at the top of this, at this node right here, what we're going to have is 2 times VT plus 2 times VOV, which is what we had before for the previous kind of current source. Except now, look at what we're doing. We're dropping this voltage, a certain amount of voltage across RB. Okay, and for this thing to work, what we want is for this voltage at the output of M2, we want that to be VOV, remember? Because we want to drop across a VOV across M1. So in order to make this voltage VOV, we need this voltage VB to be equal to VT plus 2 times VOV. And to do that, what I've got to do is choose this RB correctly. Okay, in order to get this voltage right here, all I have to do is size the resistor RB. 
so that I get a very specific voltage across it. So I1 times RB is about equal to a VT, right? Because if R1 times RB is about equal to VT, then I'm dropping about a VT uh, across. Well, sorry. Then I've dropped this down by one VT here, and that puts this at VT plus two VOV. Okay, and so this is kind of what our current source is going to look like here. And just to finish off this picture, I'm going to put all this together, these two together. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this voltage out and actually drive or bias up the current source that is involved in the real amplifier. Okay, So th this stuff all in black to the left is the stuff I have to build to generate my V bias voltages. Okay, and my V bias voltages are going to be the voltage coming out here. So I can call this right V bias 2. And this right here would be V bias 1, which I can then distribute to as many different current sources that I want that are involved in the amplifier. Right, this right here is part of the amplifier that I'm trying to bias up. And if I do this, if I distribute that V bias, then I'm going to get what I want in this amplifier. I'm going to get a VOV across the bottom transistor of the amplifier's current source. Uh, let me be clear and call this the amplifier current source, which will then allow me to have the maximum swing for the amplifier that I'm biasing up. Okay. So this is one strategy to try to build this, but of course, you see problems with this strategy already. So who can tell me what the issues are with this? Yeah, I don't like that resistor either. So great instincts already, right? You see a resistor? No, we do not want the resistor. So one. Uh, I1 RB1, sorry, R, I1 RB not only uses a resistor, uh, but it's not all that well controlled. Okay, because again, this is not a resistor we're trying to match up to something, right? You can do fairly good matching in an IC process, but you cannot hit the absolute numerical value very well in an IC process. So. I mean, how, how well can you hit the right value of RB? What do you think? What percent? How many percent off would you be if you tried to make an RB through a polysilicon meandering resistor? All right, it's going to look like this. in polysilicon. It's about 20%. Okay, you're going to be off by about 20% on that. Okay, so that's not enough accuracy, I should say, in an IC process. It's just that lithography varies too much, right? So it's very difficult to, right? So, so you want to have a certain exact line width. You lay it out with this line width, but you end up with something less than that because you have undercutting of these things. Okay? The other problem is RB is too big. So it can cost a lot. All right? So there's a second issue to this, and that's you still must still account for body effect. And so you really need a much more accurate voltage across I1RB. So I1RB has got to really be equal to VT of 5 uh, minus VT of 6 uh, minus VT of 2. Okay, So that's what you really have to make it. 
uh, in order to make this, sorry, plus Vt of 6 minus Vt of 2. Okay, so we're going to do all of that. And if we don't like resistors, why don't we try something else here? And so let's replace the resistor. with what we normally like to do, and that's use transistors. So replace it with a transistor level shift. And so now let's draw what this looks like when we do this replacement. Okay, so here I'm going to draw the whole circuit for you. So there's your VDD line. And on this side, I want to bias it up using a classic current mirror. So, so that's, that's where I1 is going to come out of right here. And I'm going to actually generate the I1 on the other side. But let's first draw this side here. Um, make sure that I have enough space. So down here, what I want to do is replace RB with some kind of transistor. Okay, So here's the transistor that I'm going to use to replace RB with. I'm going to take a transistor that I'm going to diode connect in some respects. But I'm going to combine it with the transistor underneath it so that the gate of the transistor underneath it is not going to its own drain. It's, in fact, going to this diode connection for the transistor above it. All right, so this is transistor M7. Um, let me make sure I got all my letters right. So this is M4. This is M6. And then I'm still going to have this diode connected transistor at the bottom here, M5. And later on, I'll complain about that diode connected transistor. But right now, let me just stick it in because it keeps it symmetric like this, M5 and M6 and M2, et cetera. OK, and then from here, I'm going to repeat the same kind of thing, except this this node here is now going to be used as the output node. So see, M7 here has basically replaced RB. Okay, so this node now comes out, and it attaches to my transistor M2. Then I have a transistor M1 at the bottom of this here, where I'm going to play the same game here, where I'm going to take the gate of M1 and attach it to the drain of M2. Okay, But then I need to generate my reference current. And so the way I'm going to generate my reference current is actually in this thing here, where I'm going to use a current mirroring right here, put a diode connection right there. So now this is not that RB resistor. This is my RF resistor that generates my output current IREF, OK? And so this, this voltage now coming out of M2 and this voltage coming out of M1, these become my V biases. So that's V bias 2, and that's V bias 1. And these then bias up the cascode current sources associated with amplifiers. Okay, so that becomes my, my uh, current source here. So let's talk in, uh, in some detail now about how this thing is working. Right, so obviously, this whole thing right here is my V bias generator. It's generating V bias 1 and V bias 2. 
And we're specifying a very specific reference current here. So this I ref here, I can write an expression for it. I ref is simply VDD. I want the voltage dropped across this resistor. So the voltage dropped across that resistor is VDD minus VGS. And let me label this transistor. This is M3. So minus VGS of 3 minus, what else is it minus? So look at this circuit here. I just want the voltage across RF. So that's VDD minus a VGS dropped across here, which is the VGS of M3. Okay, what else is being dropped across this? Yes, exactly. So this node, this whole node right here has VGS of M1 on it. Okay, and all that then is divided by that reference resistor RF. Okay? And so now let's take a look at this whole thing and how this thing works. So we're going to have to start looking at voltages dropped across different things. So as before, across this V5, we have one VT plus a VOV. Across this M6, we have one VT plus a VO here, two VT plus two VOV. Okay. Now, I guess I should point out as well that if I'm generating I ref through this loop right here, right? So I've got diode connection to the top. I've got a, a, an apparent diode connection down here. That gives me a very specific voltage dropped across this resistor. That means I have a very specific current I ref going through this column, this branch here. So how much current do I have going through this branch? Depends on the size of the devices. If M4 and M3 are the same size, it's also going to be I ref. Okay, so through this, I ref is also flowing. Okay? And so what do I want out of this? What I want out of this, the end result is I want this to be one VOV. Because if that's one VOV, then this here, if this is an identically sized device, is also going to be a VOV. Okay? And that's really what I want. I want to make sure that I have a VOV across this bottom Casco device. Okay, so if I have a VOV across here, uh, and if I'm dropping across this a VT plus VOV, that means the voltage right here that I need is a VT plus 2 VOV. So as before, I have to drop a VT across M7. Uh, let me just be clear about one thing with this I ref thing. Those I refs are the same here as long as I choose W over L4 equal to W over L3. Okay? And so let's now do an analysis of this thing here. Let's figure out how I can get the right voltage drop across M7. What are the different ways that I can do that? And so let's start the design. And I guess for now, as we did before, let's ignore the body effect. Okay, so approach number one. Let's in okay, so if this is the case, right, then we're going to want, as before, we want the, VO, the VDS of 6 to be equal to a VOV. And so in order for that to happen, 
we need the VGS of 7. So this drop across 7 to be about equal to VT. Okay? So we want VDS of 6 to be VOV, right? Because that guarantees it's saturated. So all transistors, we're going to insist in approach 1 that all transistors are saturated. So why am I saying that? Because in approach 2, we're going to relax that requirement. Saturated. Then I have to have at least a VOV across the drain to source voltage of device M6. And that means I need to have a VGS7 uh, be equal to about a VT here. Right, because this voltage right here is 2VT plus VOV. Right? If I drop across VT across this, then that's going to give me exactly what I need. Right? It's going to give me this VT plus 2VOV at the output here, okay? which is what I'm looking for. But I have to drop across uh, M7 just a VT across its VGS. So how do we do that? We've talked about that before. And so I could just say normally uh, the VGS of 7, which we're very interested in now, is equal to a VT, but also plus a VOV uh, before, and that we can make this VOV about equal to 0 volts, device M7, huge. Okay. Uh, which means what? W over L over 7, we have to make very large. Okay? And so the immediate problem with this that we've mentioned before is that takes chip area, and that's a problem. because things start costing way too much here when you make that too large. Okay? And so, I guess just to be clear, right, what we're doing is we're taking advantage of this equation. VOV is 2 times ID over mu n C ox times W over L7 under a square root. Right? And so when we talk about making W over L large, we're talking about making that large which means that as you raise W over L, you drive down VOV, and eventually you drive it down to zero volts. Okay? So if I make that large, then I will drop across VGS of 7, 1 VT, which is exactly what I need to make this node here, VT plus 2 VOV. Okay? Are you keeping up with me? There's a lot of voltages being dropped across different places. I'll stop here and ask for questions. Questions about this? Any at all? This is difficult to keep up with because I'm pretty much going from node to node, voltage to voltage, yes. Can you break this down and how that affects the IRF? How it creates? The creates the IRF? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So anytime you want to create IRF, Right, you need to have some kind of definite volt. If I do this, that's definitely going to create an IREF. Right? So this is going to create an IREF equal to VDD over RF. Okay? The other way that we can try to create an IREF and that we have been doing is basically this. So if you do this, and that's a diode connection, then a diode connection is going to be a VGS voltage in MOS land. And so in this case, IREF is going to be equal to VDD minus the VGS1 over RF. Okay? And I have to diode connect this transistor here. So in other words, if I made this, This isn't really going to work here. It's not going to work very well because this voltage right here 
is going to take on some value that's going to be more difficult to determine what it is. Does that make sense? Right? It means this is not a very well-determined value at the drain of this device here. And so somehow I have to diode connect all these devices. I can only create uh, a well-defined IREF if I put the resistor in series with diodes. Okay? And so if you look back on this side here, right, this side is not going to be able to create the IREF. The, the left side cannot create the IREF. Can you see why? Why is it the left side cannot create the IREF? Yeah, but if I put the resistor in there, so let me, let me redraw this then. So say I did this, and I copy exactly that circuit like this, and I just make it a little simpler by just using one. Okay, so I have this. I have the option of putting the resistor there or putting it there um, toward ground. Where should I put the resistor going through this? It's got to be on the right-hand side because this is diode connected here. If this is diode connected, then I have a VGS dropped across this. If I put the resistor there, make that RF. And so in that case, that will generate IREF equal to, um, I guess I have to have VDD up here, VDD minus VGS over RF, okay? But what if I did not put the resistor on that side? What if instead I stuck the resistor on this side? Put RF right there. Now, what IREF is determined here? Exactly, you don't know this voltage here. You can determine it. It's definitely determinable because there's a lambda associated with that, right? But it's going to take on whatever VDS is necessary that corresponds to whatever the VGS is here, right? And so this cannot be the branch that determines the current because it doesn't have a well-defined voltage across that resistor, okay? You haven't defined that voltage by diode connecting the transistor, which is what's necessary. Does that make sense? Okay. And so that's what's happening in this case here. On this case here, you see this transistor? It's not diode connected. There's this, all the rest of them are diode connected, except for this one. So if I stuck a resistor somewhere here, I would not get the IRF current. Well, I would get some current, but not something that I can expect. On this side, you notice this is diode connected. And this effectively, although it's going through two devices, is diode connected. So I've got well-determined voltages across each of these which means I have a well-determined voltage across RF and so a well-determined IREF. Okay, so that's why I stuck the resistor on this second branch here. That's a good question. Okay, any other questions about this, what I'm doing here? I mean, it ends up being a VOV. And I have a complicated thing right here to try to do that. I mean, you, you could argue, hey, we just did that with that circuit before. That's true, we did. Except what I'm trying to do now is make it such that the, the device that's taking IREF, that's biasing up your actual current source device, has exactly the same VDS as your current source device, okay? which means that your current source device is going to push as much current I0 that's exactly equal to IREF. With the other source, I0 was not exactly equal to IREF if lambda is small. It is pretty much equal if lambda, sorry, if lambda is large. It is pretty much equal if lambda is small. Okay, so that's what I'm doing right now. I'm just getting an alternative current source here uh, that looks like this here, but that we have to design in. And so to design this in, if I have two VT plus two VOV at this node right here, and I'm going to drop a certain voltage across here, in order for me to end up with VT plus two VOV, I have to drop just a VT across the gate to source of M7. Okay? And the only way to do that, if you want to keep all your devices unsaturated, which is what I just went through right here, is to make device 7 huge. You make it large enough, then VOV becomes about equal to 0 volts. 
okay, which means that VGS7 becomes VT plus VOV about equal to VT if VOV is zero volts. Okay? So by making M7 large, I can make this current source work. That's approach number one. Uh, of course, we don't like approach number one because of this right here. It costs too much. Uh, but approach number one is a very viable approach, right? Because if you think about it, how many of these V bias generators are you going to have on your chip? Just one for this, right? So, so what if you make that device larger? Okay. Well, it all depends on how big your circuit is, right? If it's an analog circuit that just contains a current source and your amplifier, you're going to worry about that, right? If it's a circuit that contains that current source and then a thousand other amplifiers, you're not going to worry about it. Okay, but if it is just one current source and one amplifier, you're not going to like having that large W over L for device 7. Okay, so is there something else that we can do about this? And it turns out there is something we can do about this, and that would be approach number 2. In approach number 2, we're just going to recognize that not all transistors have to be saturated. Okay, certainly for the amplifier at the output, all of these current source transistors need to be saturated. But in this thing here, all we're trying to do with this thing is generate these voltages, V bias 1 and V bias 2. So while a lot of the transistors probably ought to be saturated, since we're sort of doing a replica biasing, some of these transistors have to be replicas of the actual current source transistors in the amplifier. Um, not all these transistors have to be saturated. So let's just take that approach here. So approach two, we're going to recognize that the devices in the actual V bias generator need not be saturated. Okay? So some can be triode. Okay? So if that's the case, then let's take a look at approach 2. Number 1, let's allow a device uh, to drop well, let's allow one of these devices to be in the triode region. And in that case, let's allow M6 to be in the triode region, since that's the device that has to drop that voltage across it. Okay? And so in this case, where, where in approach 1, we had to make sure that M7 only drops a VT across its VGS, uh, let's now allow M7 uh, to drop a full VGS that's equal to both VT, a combination of both VT and its VOV. Okay? Now, nothing's changed in terms of requirement here. We're still going to need VDS6 to be equal to a uh, V overdrive of uh, 7 here. So we still need it to be equal to a V overdrive of 7. Uh, but we're going to recognize now that we can get this by operating M6 in the triode or linear region. So let's take a look at this. So I'm going to go ahead and drop a full VGS, a full VT plus VOV across the gate to source of M7. And then M6 is going to end up with very little voltage across its VDS. All right? Certainly below a VOV, but who cares? Right? It's still going to function. It's just not going to be a saturated transistor. It's not going to have a large output resistance. But it's not in the signal path of any amplifiers. It's in this biasing source. So we don't care. All right. There's W over L7. 
times VGS7 minus VT squared. Okay, M6 is going to be in the triode region, otherwise known as linear. But its current now, ID6, is going to be 1 half mu n CR times VDS of 6 minus VDS of 6 squared. Okay, so that's just the linear current equation, uh, sorry, the triode current equation for a triode MOS transistor. Okay, and so what do we want? Well, when VGS of 7 is equal to VT plus an overdrive of 7, yes? V of 7. Okay, still need VDS 6. E. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, let's scratch that one here. We don't need this, actually, because that's no longer going to be in saturation. So we don't need that there, because that's actually going to be less than VV, VO, VOV 7 there. Um, Okay, so back to this. What we want here, VGS, we want to be VT plus VO7. And so as a consequence, we would love VGS7 and 6 and Yeah, okay, so v, VDS, we still need this actually here, right? So, because VOV7 is going to be smaller now, right? So we actually want VOV7 to be a little bit smaller here. So we still want this VDS6, right? So l let me draw this out here, show you what I mean here. So we have this. This is the basic circuit we're looking at. This is M7. That's M6. Okay. So if we look at the voltages across this here, then VGS6, and what we really want here is VGS6 here, is going to be VGS7 plus a VOV of 7. Okay. Because if I were to look at, say, this point right here, just look at the VGS of 7 here. Let me put that another Plus a VOV of 7, right? But the gate voltage across VGS 6 is exactly the same as that, right? In other words, the gate voltage across v, VGS of 6 is, is equal to the voltage at this point right here, right? So that means if I'm going to drop across 6 here, then what I'm going to need to drop is uh, I'm going to have to have a VOV of 7 across this, right? So in order me, for me to have VGS 6 right here, then I need to have VGS 6 equal to the VGS of 7 plus a VOV of 7, because VGS of 7 is right here, plus a VOV of 7 right there. And so in the end, this is going to be equal to a VT plus a 2 times VOV of 7. I need this to be the effective VOV6. Okay, so in other words, I need VOV6 to be equal to two times a VOV of seven in order for this to work. Okay? And so, feeding off of this, VDS6 is 2 VOV7. It would keep it in saturation. Uh, 
Yeah, it, it won't, though, because I'm going to size my devices such that it's not. Okay, so in other words, in order, see, I already know that I cannot get M6 to stay in saturation if I drop across M7 VT plus VOV, right? In order to keep M6 in saturation, I had to drop across M7 one VT, right? And so what I'm doing now is I'm going to size M6 and M7, okay, such that M6 requires a larger VOV across it, right? It'll still have a VOV7 across it, right? I still need the VOV7 to be dropped across M6, right? 7. Except M6 requires a larger VOV, and so that's going to be less than its VOV, so it's going to be trialed with this here because now you, have to, you have to go from our beginning discussion, right? In order for this to work, I had to drop a VOV across M6, okay? But I had to drop that VOV across M6 because I need this voltage. This is our main goal. I need this voltage to be VT plus 2 VOV right here, okay? And because of the way this is biased up, in order for that to be VT plus 2 VOV, um, I'm going to have to drop across here either one VT, or if I want to drop across this a VT and a VOV, then I'm going to have to operate M6 in a triode region. And so I'm sort of recognizing that, that I'm going to operate M6 in a triode region where it needs to have two VOVs of, se of device 7 in order to be in saturation, but I'm only going to give it one VOV across that so it's going to be triode. Does that make sense? You're going to have to stare at this a couple more times. I see some people can see it, some cannot. But this is something you have to stare at to really look at this. Okay, but let me finish off the analysis here. So I'm going to analyze this by just assuming right now that device 6 is in the triode region. Okay, so I'm just going to use the fact that ID7 is, in fact, equal to ID6, which means I can write that 1 half mu n C ox times W over L7 times the VOV, the overage voltage of 7, this is VGS minus VT for 7, so that's just VOV7 squared, is going to equal now the current through 6, which is now dictated by the triode region current equation. So 1 half mu n times, and now I'm going to try to drop across the VGS minus VT of 6, this value right here, this 2 VOV7. And so in this equation, I'll put 2 VOV7 there times VOV7. So finishing off the, uh, uh, the triode equation here. So on the VOV7 here as VDS, that's squared. Okay? And so this whole thing is going to be 3 times VOV7 squared. Okay, if I cancel things out on both sides, so obviously the mu n c ox and one halves go away there. But then I have a VOV7 squared there, I have a 3 VOV7 squared, and this all then boils down to W over L7 has to be chosen to be 3 times W over L6, which means I can finally write down all the design equations for this particular design here in order to make this work through approach number two. Uh, but that means that W over L6 has to be chosen to be one third of W over L7. And all other W over Ls are equal to W over L7. So W over L7 becomes the reference W over L. That's what's being used in the actual amplifier out there. But you have to choose device 6 to be smaller now in order to accommodate the needs of this current source. OK? Any questions about this now? So you see what I've done? I've done this analysis by just assuming that device 6 has to be in triode because I want to drop a full VT plus VOV across the gate to source of device 7. 
Okay, that automatically means device six is probably going to have to be in triode, but it's not going to have zero volts across it necessarily because I'm choosing its size to be smaller than the rest of the devices, okay, which means it has to support a certain amount of VDS in order to stay saturated. I'm not giving it that VDS, but it doesn't matter because all I really care about is not whether VM6 stays in saturation or or whether it's in triode, I care only that I'm delivering VT plus 2 VOV to this node right here, uh, which is at the gate of M2. All right? And if I deliver that, then that will allow me then to have the right voltage right here, VOV, across this transistor at the output. Okay? Questions? This is one of the more complicated things we'll be talking about this semester here, so... You're, if you have questions, yes. Um, the VGS across M7. VGS across M7. Yeah. Uh, why do you say that? VT plus two VOV there. VGS across, no, I mean, if it has a VT, then it's not cut off, right? It's still above that, right? So it's not cut off, but that, that's approach number one. You're almost getting it to cut off. But in approach number two, you're well above that, right? So you're okay still. Yes? The VB gen oh, with this resistor? Yeah. Oh, but no matter what, the VB would have had to have that resistor too. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, th I mean, this thing would have had to have been a resistor yeah. too. Got less resistor. Yeah, well, you got less resistor. I guess the, the bigger problem here is that you're now using this resistor here to, yeah, I see what you're saying. That the resistor is not a well defined value in the end, right? So it still has to be trim to some extent. But I guess the, at least this requires only one resistor. Is there a second design that specifies Yeah, there is, except um, we may talk about those at the very end of this, at the very end of this class, but there are ways to do it without a resistor, but then you're, you're I'm not sure the transistor parameters are any better. <laughs> okay, so the way that you really do this is a lot of times you'll trim the reference resistors. Okay, but you can also, when we get into other current sources, what we will be worried about is power supply rejection. So power supply dependence and temperature dependence of current sources. So we will actually pit two, uh, two phenomena against each other to generate a voltage, which we actually do call a magic voltage. That's what a band gap reference is. And that's a very stable voltage that you can then put across any resistor or device or biasing up your supply or so to get a very stable type of bias point, okay? But at least in these that I'm talking about, most of the time you will use a resistor to, to generate these currents, but there are sources that avoid those resistors. But whether they're better than the ones with the resistors or not, I'm not sure I could say for sure. Depends on your application, okay? All right, so that's it for current sources for now. Um, well, no, that's not it. <laughs> we got one more issue with this. Okay, so take a look at what we've generated right here. Okay, we've generated something a lot more complicated than we necessarily need to, right? And, and the reason why we got to this point is because we sort of tried to stick with generic analog design. Right, generic analog design means that you are trying to keep all your devices saturated as best as you can. Okay, and with this current source, we finally just threw up our hands and said, okay, wait a minute, we don't need to keep all our devices saturated. Okay, if that's the case, then there isn't really a need for a lot of this stuff here. Okay, that in fact, we can simplify this whole thing. So let me just say right here, this is all great, what we've done, but there's one problem and that's that we're using too much voltage.
to do all of this. Okay, that in fact there is a simpler design that we can go to. And so let me show the simpler design. So can fix this as follows. And this really comes about with the fact that, hey, we're going to operate these devices uh, anyway in, in certain regions. So here's a simpler design where now I'm not going to draw the resistors that generate these currents here, but there's I1. And instead of going into that stack of devices there, let's now just go into a single device on this side. Same as, well, same as one of those devices on the other side there. And let me pull this to the left a bit. This up that stack of transistors that we had before. Well, this time, let me twist this transistor around so it really looks like a V-bias generator as we've been drawing them in the past. So drawing that gate directly attached again to the drain of the other device. So let's call this M3 and this M4. And this now comes out to deliver the bias points for the gates of these cascode devices here. And this is M1 and M2. And so this is exactly the same thing that we've drawn before. right? It's going to guarantee for us that we have a VOV across here. Uh, which then allows this one to drop a VOV, which means that the minimum output signal here is going to be two VOV, which is what we want. Okay, except now we're generating the bias point for M4, which was the most difficult thing from last time, backing up devices and one going to triode, one going into whatever. We just have a diode connected M7 here. We're recognizing that the current through seven is the same as the current through three uh, because you know we're using that same type of biasing that I had in the previous uh, source. Both now saturated transistors because M7 is diode connected, right? And M3 is going to be saturated because it's effectively diode connected too, except through another transistor. So this now becomes one half mu n C ox times W over L7. And so what I want here again is to drop two VOVs across M7 because after all we still have that same requirement here. The basic requirement is that we need at this node VT plus two VOVs so that we can drop across M4 a VT plus VOV and get a VOV right here. Okay, We still want that and so in this case now let's go ahead and put that in green. So that's where this two VOVs comes in right here. So I want two VOVs of my reference device, which is going to be device three in this case. That's squared. And that I'm going to equate to the current in device three, which is one half mu n C ox times W over L3 times a VOV of three squared. Okay, and looking at this again, you know, these guys cancel out there. I'm looking for the ratio of W over L's. Uh, this 2 becomes a 4, uh, and then these VOVs cancel each other out. And so what you end up with is that W over L7 equals 1 fourth W over L3. equals one-fourth of what I'll just call W over L, where this W over L is the W over L of all the transistors 
except M7. Okay, and so that gives us the design equations for this new current source, which is much simplified from before, but is much smarter than before. Right? We should have done this from the very beginning. But we went through that cycle to get to this current source just so you can see the type of thinking involved to look at the different current sources. Right? You see, first you try a resistor to drop a voltage across that. Then you make efforts to try to replace everything with a voltage source. And then finally, you can come to this simplified current source. So this actually also plots out the history of how these current sources were built. Right? When people were first trying to do this, they first thought of the resistive thing. And they were using the resistive thing. Then they went to that stack that I had shown you with all those stack transistors. And they could do that because they had a lot of supply voltage. But in this day and age, when the supply voltage has shrunk uh, to 1 volt, 1.1 volts or so, right now you can no longer do a lot of that stuff. And so the adjustment has been made to go after a current source like this, which does approximately the same thing in generating the V bias uh, for this M2 device, but does so in just one stage that allows you then to drop much less voltage across the supply. Okay? All right, so we'll end here. And next time we'll start talking about matching of current sources.